re-enchanting humanity, a defense of the human spirit against anti-humanism, misanthropy, mysticism, and primitivism, by Murray Bookchin, published by Castle, 1995. A caveat to the reader. Today when environmentalism is under assault by Republican reactionaries in the United States, Tory reactionaries in Britain, and apologists for corporate interests everywhere, I wish to reiterate my emphatic support for all environmentalist tendencies that seek to preserve biotic diversity clean air and water, chemically untainted foods, and wilderness areas. Much of my life, some 40 years as a writer, lecturer, and activist in various movements, has been and remains assiduously committed to these environmental goals. It would be gross demagoguery for anti-humanists, misanthropes, and primitivists, who in my view are seriously damaging the environmental cause, to identify their own regressive ideas with ecology as such and to challenge any criticism of them as an endeavor to subvert the ecology movement. I find it necessary to make this statement to the reader because some years ago, a leading light in the deep ecology tendency scandalously accused me in the progressive of capitulating to reactionaries in the United States after I criticized his ecomistical views as deleterious to the environmental movement. Nor is he, the only one who has done so over the years in one way or another. I have encountered such cynical behavior only once before in my lifetime, during the 1930s, when devotees of Stalin's version of communism designated all of their critics as fascists and worse for daring to challenge their policies. Such behavior should be severely reproved as cynical and demagogic if environmentalists are not to surrender the moral integrity that they claim for themselves and their ideas. What is at stake in such rhetorical charges is whether dissenting views within the ecology movement, which should be encouraged if the movement is to advance, are even possible or whether criticisms that concern the welfare of that movement can be intelligently explored on their own terms. Having expressed this concern, it would be foolhardy to ignore the tendency of anti-humanism, particularly trends like sociobiology Malthusianism, and deep ecology, to feed into the politically charged social Darwinism that is very much abroad today. The animalization of humanity that I believe these trends foster, their regressive absorption of major social concerns into biology, be they expressed in terms of genetics, demographics, or biocentrism, is now being stridently echoed by reactionary legislators who use zoological reductionism as an ideological weapon for waging war on the poor, the underprivileged, and the helpless. Thus in debates in the U.S. Congress on reducing welfare benefits to the needy, a legislator from Florida who opposes such aid is reported to have held up a sign that said do not feed the alligators and noted, we post these warnings because unnatural sick, feeding and artificial sickle care creates dependency. A legislator from Wyoming is reported to have drawn a similar parallel with wolves, Robin Toner, resolved, no more bleeding hearts, New York Times, Week in Review section, July 16, 1995. In my view, this kind of natural law mentality directed overwhelmingly against the poor and underprivileged who desperately need material assistance, can very easily be derived from ideologies that reduce human attributes to the interplay of genes, to a demographics based on the behavior of fruit flies, and to a biocentrism that renders human beings interchangeable with alligators and wolves in terms of their intrinsic worth. How precariously close these variants of anti-humanism are to the lethal social ideologies that swept through Europe and America in the 1920s and 1930s, I shall leave it to the informed reader to judge. Signed Murray Bookchin, May 1995 Acknowledgements I cannot sufficiently thank my companion and colleague, Janet Beale, for her scrupulous reading and copy editing of this book, as well as for her advice at every point in its preparation and her assistance in researching material for certain chapters. Her own unfinished book on deep ecology was one of the major sources for material on which I relied in writing my chapter on ecomysticism. To my editor, Steve Cook of Castle, I owe a genuine debt for encouraging me throughout the preparation of the manuscript and for his patience in delays that were caused by ill health. I would also like to thank Stephen Best and Richard Vollin for reading and advising me on my chapter on postmodernism. Their own work in this area has been immensely stimulating and deserves the widest reading public.
For the rest, the views I express in the following pages are entirely my own, and I alone must claim responsibility for any defects the book may contain. These views have been in the making for years and reflect changing polemical emphases in my writings that have emerged over time. Prologue This book deals with one of the most troubling conditions that afflicts society at the present time, a sweeping failure of nerve. I am speaking of a deep-seated cultural malaise that reflects a waning belief in our species' creative abilities. In a very real sense, we seem to be afraid of ourselves, of our uniquely human attributes. We seem to be suffering from a decline in human self-confidence and in our ability to create ethically meaningful lives that enrich humanity and the non-human world. This decline in human self-confidence, to be sure, is not new. The ancient Mediterranean world fell into a period of declining moral stamina and self-worth that contributed to the onset of the so-called Dark Ages in Europe. Medieval Europe, particularly in the 14th century and after, was torn apart spiritually and materially by dislocations so formidable that, as François Villain, France's greatest poet, lamented, roaming wolves from the countryside ate wind in the dangerous and famine-stricken streets of Paris. Yet in both of these periods, a sense of hope still lingered on in the human spirit, a belief in the moral and social redemption of humanity. Leprous as the human condition seemed to men and women in those demoralizing times, they shared a belief that our species was capable of achieving a better moral and social dispensation. Early Christianity as it emerged from the dying ancient world, proclaimed the ultimate power of human virtue to achieve an earthly paradise and affirmed the existence of a providential design to guide errant souls. The Protestant Reformation that took form as early as the 14th century advanced a new message of individuality self-certainty, and, in its more radical forms, the aspiration toward a sharing communistic society free of hierarchy. In contrast to these earlier times, our own era, as the third millennium comes into view, proclaims a very different spiritual and social message. Even as technological advances offer the possibility of unprecedented material security, free time, physical well-being, and a reharmonization of our relationships with the natural world, a growing number of writers and speakers tell us that our very ingenuity in technology is really evidence of a chilling failure, resulting from our innate hubris, to integrate our lives with the natural world. Indeed, we are asked to regard our remarkable human abilities for thought and innovation as attributes destructive of our very selves as well as the natural world. We are being taught to mistrust our abilities as human beings, to constrain our preening arrogance, presumably because we have set ourselves up as a species against the rest of the world of life. Such writers often personify our various institutional and technological achievements as demonic extensions of our own anthropocentric impulses and indifference to other living beings. Amidst a farrago of essentially misanthropic proclamations, we are hard put to know whether our own achievements are our friends or foes. Yet in a certain sense some forces are demonic indeed, particularly giant corporations and nation-states. These very forces act oppressively upon our lives effacing our faith in freedom and community by their commanding influence and complexity. The more intimate social life that, existed in villages, towns, and neighborhoods only a century ago has yielded to an overpowering institutional gigantism that determines all aspects of our lives from the ordinary affairs of everyday life to great social upheavals on a worldwide scale. Hence it is not surprising that social life appears to unfold like an inexplicable mystery, beyond our ordinary understanding and control. Whether we see ourselves as villains or victims, we feel ourselves sinking into a morass of commanding social forces, ideological as well as institutional, that define our behavior and drain our very ability for self-determination in personal and public affairs. Helplessly at the disposal of vast socio-economic cross-currents, we are manipulated by a Kafkaesque world too cryptic to fathom. Our domestic politics are becoming too national in scope to allow for local forms of intervention, even as our international politics are becoming too worldwide in scope to be comprehended amidst the rhetoric of global markets and global dependencies. Our lives include even more grim realities, such as the proliferation of nuclear weapons and materials, the socially induced famines that plague the so-called third world, 
the almost unimpeded destruction of aboriginal cultures and the biosphere, the spread of tyranny over much of the planet even as world leaders smugly extol new advances in personal and social freedom. The list of contemporary malfeasances at every level of life could be extended endlessly, from the implosion of the inner cities to the destruction of the ozone layer. Hence the loss of self-certainty that marked popular attitudes only two generations ago and the susceptibility of the public to an inwardly oriented, often misanthropic, spiritualism and a privatistic withdrawal from public life into mystical or quasi-mystical belief systems. It is precisely these belief systems that this book seeks to examine and sharply criticize. I am acutely aware that many apparently similar books have already appeared, deriding the innovative ideas generated by the radical 1960s and calling for a conservative cultural retrenchment to traditional family values, religious beliefs, conventional virtues, and right-wing political ideologies. We have more books these days on virtues, cultural and social, than we know what to do with. As a lifelong social radical, I have no intention of adding to the regressive litany of woes presumably caused by radical lifestyles and values, or calling for the revival of established traditions, many of them repellent. In the cultural wars that American conservatives have proclaimed in recent years, I stand basically with their opponents, women seeking full equality in a largely patricentric society, the underprivileged and victims of racial discrimination, environmentalists who are seeking to rescue our life-sustaining planet from corporate depredation, and the diminishing number of radical people who are seeking to create a rational society. It is largely because of my commitment to these people and causes, in fact, that I have written this book. I am deeply disturbed by the conservative literature that invokes a traditional, usually hierarchical, hidebound past. But paradoxical as it may seem, I am also deeply disturbed by its pseudo-radical complement, the so-called new paradigm or generically new age literature that disenchants us with our humanity indeed, that summons us to regard ourselves as an ugly destructive excrescence of natural evolution, whether as a species, a gender, an ethnic group, or a nationality. Like its conservative and traditionalist counterpart, the New Age mentality that demonizes human beings in whole or in part is not necessarily unified or coherent. Unlike many conservative traditionalists, New Age mystics celebrate the contradictions of their paradigm, its languid intellectual irresponsibility, and its seeming pluralism. More than one proponent of the view that humanity is a delinquent species in an otherwise amiable biosphere or circle of beings, as the Reverend Thomas Berry puts it, will sharply disclaim my characterization of their views. Yet one does not have to look too far beneath the surface to find a common underlying theme that unites the highly particularistic, theistic, biocentric, postmodernist, misanthropic, and generically mystical literature. What I believe brings them together, and many of them express their views in the same journals and anthologies, is a common deprecation of the remarkable features that make our species unique in the biosphere. Whether explicitly or implicitly, they deride humanity's ability for innovation, its technological prowess, its potentiality for progress, and, above all, its capacity for rationality. I have thus found it appropriate to call this ensemble of deprecatory attitudes anti-humanism, anti-humanism, in sharp contrast to the humanistic ideologies advanced by rationalism, various socialisms, and some forms of liberalism, is a worldview that places little or no emphasis on social concerns. The message it offers is primarily one of spiritual hygiene, personal withdrawal, and a general disdain for humanistic attributes such as reason and innovation in impacting upon the natural and social worlds. It offers no serious challenge to modern secular power. Rather, it tilts, when it does not tumble headlong, toward self-oriented nostrums, and disturbingly regressive ones at that. Anti-humanists commonly extol an intuitionism supported by the mythopoeic mentality of the distant, preliterate past of our species. In varying degrees, they demean civilization, progress, and science, denying either their reality or their value as goals worthy of respect. Above all, anti-humanists deprecate or deny humanity's most distinctive hallmark, reason, and its extraordinary powers to grasp, intervene into, 
and play a guiding role in altering social and natural reality. Many anti-humanists harbor a static mindset, partly the result of their reverence for a mythologized nature, sometimes seen as a realm of cyclical eternal recurrences, in which they strive to passively dwell rather than actively live as innovative beings, and partly, too, the result of their entombment in a pantheistic cosmic womb, a night in which all cows are black, to use a favorite aphorism of Hegel's, imbued with an outlook that dilutes active selfhood and social involvement. So wide-ranging and multifarious, in fact, are the anti-rational moods in contemporary Western culture that they often defy clear characterization apart from their shared antipathy for reason and the mostly intuitive nostrums with which they propose to replace it. In exploring these moods, the reader will often be obliged to deal with criss-crossing ideas that are poorly formulated or directly expressed. Indeed, some anti-humanists do not hesitate to invoke science, a bete noir to the more naive anti-humanists, in support of their views. Nor will the reader encounter many spokespeople who synthesize coherence in their anti-humanism. Elusiveness, prettified as pluralism and diversity has become a well-cultivated art in the world we shall be entering. Invoking the simplest rational canons of logical discourse is fruitless in a realm that regards reason as such as a form of tyranny or logocentricity. Not infrequently anti-humanist moods are viscerally predisposed not toward discovering truth but toward gaining ritualistic and non-rational insights. Apart from the extravagant use of words like oneness, interconnectedness, cosmic, and ecological, the anti-humanist vocabulary is almost willfully vague. Quite often, in a dazzling display of eclectic pluralism, a euphemism for contradiction almost anything goes, without any regard for consistency or clarity. I find it particularly ironic that at a time when so many of these anti-humanistic books and articles exalt the need to re-enchant nature, the planet, indeed the entire cosmos, the most pronounced effect they have had is to disenchant humanity itself specifically its unique potentiality for rationality. Which raises a central concern of this book, the assault anti-humanism has mounted against the rational faculties that make us human. For it is not specific traits of individual human beings that anti-humanists attack but the general and unique attributes that define human beings as a species. In the end, it is our claim to be able to reason and to rationally intervene in the world around us that is under siege. The special features that make us remarkable products of natural evolution are in one way or another viewed with acute suspicion or forcefully maligned. To unravel the ensemble of convoluted, contradictory notions that can be characterized as anti-humanist, with their tangled roots in a highly intuitive psychology, is the task of this book. Each form of anti-humanism, be it cultural primitivism, mystical ecologism, or a variety of postmodernism, must be examined on its own terms. Suffice it to say here that far too many anti-humanists see the malaise that afflicts modern society as rooted not in irrationality, be it in the spiritual or material sphere of life, but in precisely the opposite, in rationality and a humanistic anthropocentrism. Beyond this basic premise anti-humanism strays in every conceivable direction such that it defies clear categorization and logical coherence. Normally this modus operandi would be regarded as an intellectual failing, but anti-humanism cherishes it as evidence of flexibility. One word in particular needs explication if this book is to be properly understood. Inasmuch as I argue for a secular and naturalistic view of the world, I feel obliged to justify my use of the word re-enchanting in the title of this book. This word, after all, suggests a mystical bewitchment consistent with views held by many anti-humanists, not humanists. My reasons for employing the word are simple, I am using it partly as a spoof, and partly as a metaphorical expression of my respect for what the human species could be and what it could achieve if it applied its intellectual faculties to the creation of a rational society. I do not mean rational here in a purified, abstract, merely philosophical sense, but rather in the sense of a lived rationality that, at its best, fosters cooperation, empathy a sense of responsibility for the biosphere, and new ideas of community and consociation. 
a society guided by this existential form of reason must replace the present predatory society that I am convinced threatens the survival of human and most non-human life. It is this socially critical vision that I hope to commend to the reader, a vision I have held in more than six decades of struggle against oppression, domination, hierarchy class rule and the debasement of life to a mere resource for personal enrichment and greed. For this book advocates no compromise with the status quo and the mentality it fosters. I am as much opposed to a humanism structured around self-aggrandizement and plunder as I am to an anti-humanism structured around humanity's self-effacement in a mystical all-embracing cosmos. Note. Whatever its chronology the use of humanism to mean a crude anthropocentric and technocratic use of the planet in strictly human interests, often socially unspecified, has its contemporary origins in Martin Heidegger's Brief über den Humanismus, Letter on Humanism, written in 1947, which gained favor among the post-war French philosophes of the existentialist and later postmodernist vintage. Heidegger's very flawed and sinister brief is a masterpiece of misinterpretation and irresponsible reasoning. The humanist-anti-humanist -humanist dichotomy has its historical roots primarily in the post-war cynicism and nihilism of the 1950s and 1960s. End note. While human beings differ fundamentally from other life forms in their ability to bring meaning and reason to the world, precisely because of these remarkable abilities they are ethically obliged to develop a firm sense of responsibility to non-human beings and the planet as a whole. Indeed, this book advances a view that is based on neither a Pollyanna philanthropo nor a repellent misanthropes, but on a transcendence of both of these one-sided views. There is, I submit, an outlook that goes beyond the dichotomy of an angelic and demonic humanity to a sublation that gives due emphasis to humanity's affinities with non-human life on the one hand and to the satisfaction of its own special requirements on the other. The current literature all too often offers readers either one extreme or another, either the biocentric or the anthropocentric, rather than a wide spectrum of views that allows for a sense of social and ecological responsibility. It is the one-sided, mutually exclusive dogmas exemplified by these two centricities that I emphatically wish to transcend. Tragically more and more people today agree with one or the other of the extreme, nonsensical notions, that human beings are inherently deleterious to almost everything around them, or that everything around us was created exclusively for human use. I would hope that these pages provide a better map to negotiate the conflicting centricities in the modern cultural landscape. More specifically the void created by these extremes must be filled by a new humanism based on an ethics of complementarity, as I called it in my 1982 book The Ecology of Freedom. Note. Murray Bookchin, The Ecology of Freedom, Palo Alto CA, Cheshire Books, 1982, republished, with new introduction, by Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1991. End note. There are many reasons for frustration and anger about the human condition, but there are none, I submit, for demeaning humanity let alone for viewing its unique rational abilities as demonic. Indeed, there are good reasons to cherish our species for the splendors it has achieved, often against incredible odds, and that it certainly can achieve if reason in all its fullness can be brought into the world, most particularly into the management of social and ecological affairs. Dated February 1995